I'd like to talk about my process of creating a lighting design and how I use Vectorworks, particularly the 3D part of the program, to really go into how a scenic and lighting design will work together. I'd like to show how the designer can fully navigate around the rig that they've made in order to gain a much better perspective on what it is that they have created, as well as being able to troubleshoot potential problems along the way. This will hopefully allow the lighting designer and also other collaborators to be just that little bit more prepared when it comes to working in the theatre space itself. This is the lighting plot of a very recent production of mine. Um, it's Wendy and Peter Pan at the Royal Lyceum Theatre in Edinburgh. Uh, this is a new and very beautiful retelling of the traditional Peter Pan story. Uh, the set design used the very simple concept of setting the show within the theatrical playground and to that end most of the theatrical elements were left on show. The masking was to be relatively minimal and the director and designer actively wanted to see the lighting rig. The only thing we wanted to disguise was the actor's flying apparatus. The set was primarily made from steel deck rostra on metal frames and the floor was covered with blue foam bricks. Um, some lovely scenic elements as well, such as the rainbow of balloons, a painted backdrop for Neverland, as well as a large kabuki-style pirate sail for Captain Hook's ship. All of this was drawn in considerable detail in AutoCAD by the designer Max Johns. One of the very first things I do when I receive a drawing like this is to check that the origin of the file is going to match up with the center line and the setting line um, of the venue. The reason for doing this is so that all coordinate values for any objects are by default relative to those points. What I do is select all of the objects in the drawing and at the point of the center line and the setting line, using the Move by Points tool, I move all of them to the internal origin. What I like to do is add a 3D origin symbol into my drawing. This is something I've created and lives in my resource browser. So if I was to double click this um, and click there, and if I was then to rotate around that, uh, you can see um, that I have this 3D origin symbol sitting on the um, origin of the drawing. One of the things I like to do when I've got a plan and a stage section um, such as this um, is to take the stage section and flip it so that it actually when we are looking at the stage from a left or right view we can actually see the uh, stage section in its correct position and it's a fantastically useful uh, reference point uh, for developing your 3D model. Um, so the first thing to do is to zoom into your origin marker and if we just run the points tool again and let's just keep it onto one duplicate and let's keep the original and just pull it across here okay and if I'm just going to constrain the um, line there and then click it onto the stage floor you'll notice that the stage floor is actually um, a raked stage and more of that a little bit later and let's just go to a left isometric view. You can see the origin marker if I go to um, OpenGL. So just go back to wireframe again. And using the set working plane tool, I need to create a, a plane about which I'm going to rotate this section drawing. So using the first mode, I draw X axis, and then I draw a Y axis. And there you have a new working plane created. I'm just going to name that and save it. So let's name it front and press OK. And then I've got that. I can always recall that whenever I need it. And then select the section geometry. And then using the rotate tool, click once and click um, again. And now the section is rotated. Once that's done, um, if I go to a left view, or in fact a right view, um, I can see my section is aligned with the view that I'm looking at. Now I want to very quickly jump in and start drawing my decks. Um, and I know that Max, the designer, has been pretty fastidious about his classing. Um, I'm going to use the visibility tool and I'm going to use it on 
uh, just visible and classes. And if I just mouse over um, some of these elements, I can see that here we've got class WPP Dex, and that's the um, the class that he's drawn the Dex I'm using. If I was to select one of the um, items in the deck class. And if I was to double click on this, I set the double click function to make only the classes of the selected objects visible. Once you have your classes of your of the decks available to you now, just on their own, I um, selected or I would select the four stage one, the first one, and just run the event uh, design command create stage I've set up these already but I'm just going to change the height of this one to 180 because that's what it needs to be for the first one and they're all going to go on to the object class of none which I've also um, made visible and if I just press OK the command runs and immediately I've got um, some 8x4 decks um, created in that space. Um, the only thing now to do is to uh, run the command individually for each one of these um, polygons and then you'll have um, a whole set of 8x4 decks laid out for you in um, probably in the most efficient way um, possible because uh, that's how the algorithm will work it out. I've run the command now and as you can see I've got individual deck items in place um, of those uh, polylines and if you were to go into a 3D view um, you will be able to see those um, decks all at their correct heights but what I want to see is the actual lacing of the deck objects themselves. The Vectorworks deck objects don't necessarily show this level of detail so I need to swap out the deck objects with my own bespoke symbols which do show that level of detail. My general view is that many of the plugin objects are great for getting a good design overview but when you need a particular level of detail then you will need to create and use your own geometry. In this case that's a relatively simple operation and Vectorworks has provided a tool to do just that. With that said, what I should do then is select the four stage objects and run the command spotlight object conversion replace with stock symbols and with the 8x4 you can just replace it with the steel deck 8 foot and with the 4x4 you replace with the steel deck 4 foot and press OK and immediately those are converted to symbols and if I was to take a look at these and actually go into OpenGL you can see that they've now been replaced with these um, slightly more realistic deck symbols. Now the only thing to do now is to run the command again for each uh, group of deck objects. Now that you have your deck objects converted to 2D, 3D hybrid symbols if you go to a um, right isometric view, you can see that some of your symbols are standing at a good height and that's because the um, conversion tool puts them at the height that the stage deck was set to. But you can see here, because we have our elevation um, in line with our, our um, model, you can see that some of our deck symbols are cutting through the, um, the stage floor because our stage floor is raked. So what we need to do is we need to rotate those um, decks and that is exactly what Max, uh, Max Johns, the designer, did. But because these are 2D, 3D hybrid symbols, they won't rotate um, in a 3D view. So we need to change those. We need to actually strip out the 2D geometry. So if I group these symbols just by pressing Command G, and if I just double click in here, now what I can, what I've all I've done really is just get rid of all the other symbols that we don't need to deal with. And if I was to select this group of symbols here using the um, C 
select similar tool and then if I was to just go replace and replace them with the 3D version of this deck you can see that they are all replaced if I was going to just select that and do exactly the same again um, press OK and then if I was to use the rotate tool and click on the origin there you will see by picking up a second point I can align it with the rate stage I have in my section there. Of course now you've changed the 2D 3D hybrid symbol into a 3D symbol you've lost all the 2D geometry so you can put that back very quickly if you um, select your group and go into it and if you select all the objects um, together if you go to spotlight architectural and create auto hybrid um, it will do that for you and from that moment on you can add the 2D geometry if you like um, which is a little bit laborious uh, it has to be said um, but um, probably worth it in the end once the 2D geometry is completed you can take a look at the 3D view this sequence shows all of the elements as they're built up so the deck, the deck legs are created, then the handrails go on, um, some scenery and masking, um, some of the flown scenery, We're adding some overhead lighting, um, quite a lot of side light, the proscenium arch, some front of house lighting, and finally the circles. And now you can see a really good overview of the design, which now includes the lighting rig, so you can see how it all will look um, together when fully built. This is a fantastically useful for me to see how the lighting rig will look with the set. On this production, the masking was only designed to mask all the actor flying apparatus. So the lighting rig was going to be very much on show. The other really useful aspect of seeing things like this is to be able to check if instruments are going to do what you've intended particularly on a multi-level set like this where proving shots the old fashion fashioned way by drawing section cuts can be quite tedious. There is a new data tag tool now which can add extra data reporting to some of the older tools. Um, so for instance I can now attach a data tag to an object in a section drawing and this will follow its associated object with any of, of its information. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean the usual stuff, but also bespoke information as well. Because this production has a rate stage, I wanted to show the actual trim heights of lighting pipes above the rake. This makes it easier for the crew to get the heights just right. I first of all need to create a rate working plane. This is relatively easily done by using the plane tool and the second mode, and as you can see I've picked up the uh, surface there um, I'm going to save that and name it break and then I'm just going to shift the X and Y and Z axis um, to the origin there um, the most important one is the is the um, the angle of the plane at, um, which is there um, and then we just set that to the active plane and you can see it there on the origin of the drawing now you've created your rake working plane. If you um, double click that, now that becomes the active plane. So now if I was to select my lighting position and if I was to use the active plane mode, you can see that actually the lighting position is 7933 millimeters. Um, from the actual raked surface of the stage. This is fantastically useful for, for trimming heights um, from the ground. So how do we extract that information? Well, the way I normally do it is by adding a record. Um, if I quickly make a record, here's one I've done before. It is called a hanging positions record. And you can see if I was to edit it, um, 
um, it has one field name and that's trim from deck number and zero and press OK and all I need to do is now add that record um, to however many lighting positions I want. I can select them all using uh, the magic wand tool, but just these two at the moment. And then I just go uh, attach record, hanging positions, and there they are. And then I can just um, take the information I've got here, which is um, 7933, and just pop that in there, 7933. And you can see immediately the data tag updates. Just, just very quickly do this one, um, 7892. Um, so if I go back to the data tab, 7892 or 90, oh, um, we should really round it up. Um, and you can see that it's instantly gone into the data tag there. Um, very useful, quick workaround there. The way to set this up in the data tag is if you go and select your data tag, in fact, double click it and select tag layout. I made a field here. And if you can see here, the tag layout data use dynamic text. If you just define tag field. Now I put in this text from deck and then I have navigated to the hanging positions format, which is the which refers to the record that we've attached to the hanging position. And the field name is trim from deck, which is the only field in that um, record. And that is the way you will get um, the information from the record into your data tag. So I press OK and press OK. And that's how that works. As you can see, the ability to see a lighting design in a 2D format is incredibly important. But to then use that same geometry to see the instruments in 3D adds an extra layer of understanding to a lighting design. Vectorworks has developed the Create, Plot and Model View command that will automatically transfer geometry to design layer viewports so that they can be manipulated in a 3D environment. Most users will take each position and put it in a separate viewport. And in fact, the command will help to automate that for you. However, I find it easier to just use one. As you can see, I have different non-aligned side light positions, or to put it another way, I have positions that are at different distances from the center line. To sort this out, all you need to do is decide which position is going to be your control position, and then set the position's Z value to zero. Thereafter, you can set the other position's Z value to be relative to that. So here you can see the ladders are at minus 894 millimeters and the furthest offstage booms are at minus 2000 millimeters. What you'll need to do then is give this position, which is your control, a height of zero and boom stage right one will get a height of 2000 millimeters or minus 2000 millimeters and the ladder gets the 894 or the minus 894 millimeters uh, because they are at different uh, distances from the center line. Now what you want to do is make sure that all the lights that you are going to manipulate are all living on the same layer. Now if I was to select all of these instruments and I was to go to spotlight visualization create plot and model view if I just type in a new layer to put these instruments onto and press OK and let's just create a new model there for, for this design layer viewport to go on to. So let's call it uh, CPMV, create plot model view. And let's call it um, stage right. And press OK. And press OK. What you're left with are two viewports. Viewport 1 lives on the lighting positions layer. And viewport two lives on the create plot and model view layer stage rights. 
Okay, the first one, first viewport, we can just delete. So we're left with viewport 2. What you can also see is the original geometry. If I was to select that, you can see that this geometry has actually been moved to the de definition layer, side light stage right. We'll look at that in a second. But the first thing we need to do is we need to go to this viewport on the, the um, create plot model view layer stage right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that the active layer and I'm going to just show that layer only. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the front view of this. So what we need to do is select the viewport and using the rotate tool just run the rotate tool and the tool has rotated the viewport. Um, if I was to take a look at this viewport now and we can now rotate around that viewport and what you can see now are all the lights standing up and they are in fact staggered um, as they are in the top view. So if I was to go to a top view now and let's just go to a wireframe view if I was to put back now um, the um, the other lights and also let's just put back our footprint layer so you can now see where they should be sitting if I was to go and select our brand new viewport and using the um, move by points tool just zoom in here and select there and let's just move that now to this point. And now what you can see is the side light standing up and now I've turned on or the other geometry, if I was to go into a normal perspective view, you will be able to see that all of that side light is now on the side of the stage. What you will also notice is that the original geometry on the definition layer is still there. And if you were to change any property of these lights, that change will be reflected in the position on stage. Another project I worked on recently was a, a production of an opera called Soir Angelica for um, Opera North in Leeds in the UK. Um, the production is set in a convent and the decision was made to set it in a an unspecified northern country which meant that the colour palette for the production needed to feel quite cool. However there's quite a lot of reference made to light from the setting sun in this production and the golden light also that is reflected from a fountain into the convent cloister. I felt it was important for us to explore how that kind of light might look in the context of the set and the costume designs. I wanted to see what different colour temperatures would look like on the set and more importantly I wanted to have something to show the director in our discussions. Because I design all my work using Vectorworks it was relatively easy to show these differences with a simple 3D model of the set and add some Renderworks light objects to it. Here you can see a cool colour temperature coming through the windows of the main wall of the set. I wanted to see what the variation in colour temperature looked like but most importantly I wanted to see what the director and the designer thought. To show this setup I modelled three or four scenic pieces from drawings provided by the designer Hannah Clark. Rather than using lighting instruments I decided to use the built-in Vectorworks light objects and play around with these instead. Once I had established in OpenGL what instrument I actually needed I converted the light object into a custom object 
and that the way to do that is by adding an IES file, which is essentially a photometric reading of the light as it emerges from the fitting. In this case, it was a run-of-the-mill ETC source full par MFL. A good way to understand the value of these IES files and their use within light objects is to compare the two. Here on the left is a strip of the same source for par instruments that I'm using in the example, and on the right the lights are mimicking the same light source but using the regular light object by setting the parameters manually instead. As is quite clear, the shape and quality of the beam with the IES file is quite different and much more lifelike. Using IES files is particularly worthwhile if you're going to rake light down a wall, as in this example, or shine it through haze. The thing to do now is to create a sheet layer viewport and apply a custom render work style and watch it render. This is a bit speeded up, as you can imagine. This probably took about um, actually about 10 minutes to, to render out um, but here we go in a couple of seconds um, and there it is and then all I needed to do was to to duplicate that or make two more copies um, so I've got uh, three viewports and then all that's required after that is to go to the visualization palette um, and the light section and edit the four lights in this case and just change their color temperature. This is all you need to do. The result is three viewports, each with the same light objects but with different color temperatures applied to them. Another aspect of the production that needed some exploration was the actual light that came from the fountain itself. It is referred to as golden in the text and we wanted to explore a few options. I didn't want the light to be too literal though, but I knew that I needed some sort of gobo projection. One thing I do with um, Vectorworks uh, lighting symbols is just slightly adapt them to my own use and sometimes I redraw them and add various details. Um, the light we're going to use for these gobos is um, a Mac Viper. If I was to edit that symbol and just take a look at these, um, Most of the geometry is in Lights 2D. Um, there is other geometry here, which is um, I put in Lights Info. Um, there's a movement radius, um, which again has its uh, own class and can take on properties uh, that you set. And if I was to go to a 3D portion of the file, you can see that um, this group um, of objects are the 3D portion of the symbol and they are in the lights 3D portion. I couldn't find any commercially available gobo designs that would work with what I had in my head so I decided to create a custom gobo and put it in some automated light so that a gobo pattern could be given some movement. This time I needed to use an actual lighting instrument object as I needed to use the gobo facility. This can be a challenge in Vectorworks as it is not necessarily straightforward to see shutters and gopos in OpenGL. This is because the light emitter is buried within the instrument symbol body. When shadows are enabled, OpenGL will not allow light to pass through solid objects, which makes perfect sense. However, this is not the case with renderwork styles, as textures can be set to not cast shadows, therefore allowing light to pass through. This cannot be done in OpenGL. But I need OpenGL in order to focus the instruments and arrange the gobos correctly across the wall of the set. In order to remove this solid fill from um, the geometry of a lighting instrument, I need to go to Classes and I need to go to Lights 3D and I just take out the solid and just change it to None and press OK and press OK and now all the solid is gone and we're just left with wireframe. That means that the light which is going to emanate from this locus point will come straight out and not be affected by any solid geometry at all. 
And this will affect all objects that use the Lights 3D class. So in effect, all instruments in the drawing. Now what I wanted to do was place three focus objects and assign the focus objects or the focus points to the three individual Mac Vipers that I was going to use. I placed those around the pros in the positions that I knew I had available to me and then turned them on. One important thing to remember is that gobos and shutter assemblies will not be generated by the instrument until they are turned on. So if you want the gobo or the shutter assembly to appear in a sheet layer viewport, the light has to be turned on in the design layer. That's just a really important thing to remember. So here are all the gobos in OpenGL focused on the wall. And here they are. And here are the three viewports that we made earlier. And here are our lights, our three lights uh, ready to be rendered, um, turned on in the design layer. The final example from this production is the rendering of the shadow of a large crucifix that looms over the stage. The director needed to see where the shadow would fall. Um, this is intended to help him with some of the blocking of two of the principal singers in the rehearsal room. Here is the rendering that I did for him and here is the final result of the actual production on stage. Sometimes rather than removing the, the uh, 3D geometry or the 3D fill geometry from instrument symbols, I create dummy units, uh, which are essentially just um, a yoke and a body, but the body is just an open, open shell um, of geometry and the light can easily pass through it. Um, so you don't need to take out the 3D um, fill. So there it is. Um, now I put a shutter in here um, and just so you can see that if you move a focus point around and you're in OpenGL you can actually see um, the light moving around there. Let's put that back. So that done, um, if I just go and put uh, make a sheet layer viewport again and there it is and, and that's the, the rendered view um, of this scene and I think um, that really was helpful for the director to see to see where that shadow is going to fall. One thing that helps um, renders look a bit, little bit more compelling is if you add some grunge um, to a set. Um, nothing is perfect and theatre design departments spend a lot of time breaking costumes down, breaking scenery down to make it look used and worn and real. Um, so that's what I tend to do a little bit of in Vectorworks. By using a paintbrush in any piece of image editing software, you can easily shade in areas uh, which you can then apply to your uh, renderworks texture, which you can then add to your piece of scenery. I find that once you get the hang of it, um, it's quite a simple process. Um, although I have to grant you, it does seem a little bit long-winded at first. A theatre I've worked at many times in the past is the Orange Tree Theatre in Richmond in West London. This is an intimate in the round space that produces new and recent plays as well as revivals of lesser known classics. Over the years I've built up a near complete 3D model of the stage and auditorium um, and every time I worked there I had a new um, level of detail. A year or so ago I worked on a production of a play called Poison by Lotta Veckmans. Uh, this was set in the waiting room of a cemetery of all places. The design was a deep false ceiling in a kind of Eve Klein blue. This was meant to be fitted with down lights. I wanted the lights to actually light the actors in a meaningful way as well as could be controllable so that members of the front rows were not lit as well. Um, if we used commercial down lights in the ceiling then although they would look realistic uh, most of the auditorium would seem lit and we needed the action to be focused very much into the playing space. Um, the solution was to create a dummy downlight fitting uh, using the theatre stock of profile spots um, and these would provide the source of the light. It was really important that everything was incredibly concisely planned um, to do this. 
um, I was able to model up the light fittings and show the instruments above the ceiling um, in a very concise way, I think. Um, I used design layer section viewports as well for this. Um, nowadays, um, in Vectorworks 2019, um, they've innovated and they have clip cube viewports, which do a similar thing. Um, but in this instance, I used um, design layer section viewports uh, to show a cutaway through um, the instruments and um, the light fitting themselves. I like the way that there are various different ways of doing similar things and that just means that the software is actually really really flexible. Um, from the model I was able to produce drawings um, that I think showed the concept really clearly. Now I know going into this level of detail with a drawing may seem to some people as overkill but pre-planning to me is about proving a concept as best as possible before arriving at the theatre. And as long as dimensions are accurate and what you've designed is rigged as per the drawings, then it should work. One of the perceived problems um, with lighting in the round is how to light the actors on stage without lighting um, the audience. Um, so what I did was I put um, an actor, which is the black um, outline, um, into the space and I also added a sketch up model of um, an audience member. So in a top plan view you can see the audience member and um, there's the image prop on top of a focus point. Um, now if I was to take a 45 degree angle um, out of that and um, there is a um, one of the theatre stock instruments there and you can see that um, I've focused it onto that focus point and you can see that we're achieving pretty much a 45 degree angle onto the face of the actor there. I turn the light on and then if I go back to a 3D view I can see the light is focused on the actor but of course there's quite a lot of light on the audience member. So what we need to do is to put a shutter cut in. So if you just edit the light now, and here are the shutters. Now I've obviously thought about this in advance, uh, so I know the angle and I know the depth of the shutter that's required. But um, there's a little bit of trial and error involved, but there you are, there's the shutter that's gone in. And you can see that the um, the actor will be lit, uh, but the audience member is, shut, is cut off at around their chest height there. And that should work really, really well. Um, actors, though, um, don't necessarily stick to uh, focus points. And some, of, in my experience at the Orange Tree, um, actors do get really very, very close to the audience. So I just want to make absolutely certain um, that if an actor gets literally to the toes of an audience member, which is what does actually happen, um, that they will also still be lit. Um, so if you just nudge your um, image prop as close as you reckon is viable, then yep, there's the shadow, but um, the audience member is still, the faces at least, are still in shadow, so that means that they're not, hopefully not being blinded by um, the lights um, in the rig. Of course, this production has got a ceiling in it, um, and that pretty much cuts out quite a lot of the opportunities um, for getting light onto the actors' faces from the traditional 45 degree angle. So I had to find another route uh, and the route was to, to um, add um, instruments on each end um, that lit underneath the ceiling. And here is how that worked. Um, there's the shadows of the actors and there, as you can see, just up there are the um, instruments uh, focused on the actors. So here are a couple of renderings made from the 3D model you've just been looking at. Um, I've added a couple of extra bits and pieces, uh, a carpet tile texture which I made in, a, in an image editor, along with some furniture from the designer's drawings. Although we had no intention of using haze in the production, it is always useful to add some of the lit fog volume to the renderworks backgrounds. This always seems to help explain what you're trying to achieve. Here are some photos of Claire Price and Zubin Vala in the actual production. As you can hopefully see, the renderings really do convey the essence of the lighting and the design. 
and would certainly be able to open up discussions with your collaborators about the vision that you have. Pre-visualization in theatre is certainly within the reach of many designers now, and I'd like to think that the ability to walk through and explore a space or show the intangible will help production teams break some bigger boundaries and encourage an extra dose of risk-taking that will make stage design even more exciting in the future.